Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, as you see, I range rather widely historically, and this is a journey that I haven't really intended to take into the reception of the Plague of Athens. Uh, I suspect a lot of you are here because you really want to know what the Plague of Athens was. Well, don't expect to find out from me. But what we will certainly think about that if you want to in discussion. Right, this is why I get quite clever. That's called a wordle. Uh, this is a wordle of Thucydides' description of the Plague of Athens. What you do is you put in a piece of text and the words come up in different sizes according to how, much they, how often they appear in the text. And you'll see that the really big word is many. The Plague of Athens hit many. Dying and died are quite big too, and if you put them together, it would be very big indeed. The disease outbreak known to history as the Plague of Athens affected many areas of the Mediterranean in the mid-5th century BC and hit Athens itself in 431 to 430, at a time when Attica, the countryside surrounding the city of Athens, was besieged by the Spartan army and the rural population, the peasants, had all moved into the city for shelter. The symptoms affected every body system and normally ended with the death of the sufferer. Survivors often lost the use of their extremities. There's only one account surviving of this extraordinarily important epidemic, and that's from Thucydides, the father of scientific history, as he's often known, the Greek historian who, for medical writers, has often been one of us. In 1857, Charles Collier produced the history of the plague of Athens with remarks explanatory of its pathology. And he praised Thucydides for three things, the precision of method with closeness of detail, avoiding medical or other dogmata, so the fact it's a very empirical description without any obvious theory attached to it was seen as a really good thing, and that it produced a model of symptomatology. Now, in case you're wondering, Collier identified the condition as scarlet fever, but he had some trouble here with Thucydides' statement that normally no one had it twice. And just in case you're wondering what the ultimate cause of epidemics is for Collier, it was electrical, magnetic, and thermal agencies. So, but for him, Thucydides is nevertheless the model. Moving into the 20th century, in 1942, Logan Glendening included in his source book of medical history the complete account from Thucydides of the plague and invited his readers to ask themselves, how would I describe an epidemic that was new and strange? What would I record? In what order? And then notice how completely Thucydides covers the ground. So Thucydides is being claimed as the orderer, the recorder and orderer of facts. And the medical, right, medical reader, the physician or surgeon reading this, is explicitly being asked to identify with Thucydides. What's striking in this sort of medical eulogy of the plague description in Thucydides is it never seems to address the literary aspects of the plague. In particular, its placement for dramatic effect within Thucydides' more general description of the decline of classical Athens. Medical writers do sometimes praise the plague description for literary merits, but what they mean by literary is quite specific. For example, in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal for 1903, Charles Green Cumpston rated the description of the plague in Thucydides as one of the most beautiful pages of antique medicine. So it's, it's a beautiful description, but it's beautiful because it's, it's so right for 19th and 20th century medicine. It's taken by many medical writers as a model for their own work, in precision, in style. It unites the scientific and the artistic side of medicine. Those who do take into account Thucydides' as literature often focus on how the plague of Athens has been a model for later literature. This was true even within Greco-Roman antiquity, with accounts of plagues in other historians and poets alike having a clear debt to Thucydides in their language and their themes. 
In particular, the Roman writer Lucretius's version of the plague in Athens, which he describes in his book On the Nature of Things, De Rerum Natura, book six, reads Thucydides in a moral sense. Lucretius describes physical ills in a psychological vocabulary, and his work is aimed towards the healing of man's inner sickness. So the plague has moved even in Lucretius from being a real event which we're describing to a model for healing psychological illness. And the cure, as far as Lucretius is concerned, is Epicurean philosophy. That's what you need to cure your soul. But in particular, looking at the reception of the plague, Thucydides has been used as the standard for linking civil unrest, so plague in the body politic, with disorder in the individual bodies of sufferers. Most notable here is probably Camus' La Peste of 1947, which is based on, an, on accounts of a cholera epidemic in 1849. Camus uses the themes of plague, something that strikes at good and bad alike without any warning, to explore how people should react. Should they take it as inevitable, and, or should they join others to try and resist it? Camus asks questions about, is there a god? And if so, why do people who believe in him die with the rest? These themes are totally picking up Thucydides' description of Athens. The people of Athens, Thucydides says, realised there was no point behaving in a moral way. So there's more mortality there and all sorts of unpleasant things going on around them, dying, but also friends. Do you, do you go and see your friends because you're more likely to get it if you see your friends? So do you abandon friendship, for example? Um, Thucydides asks about whether moral actions about honouring your friends, looking after people, honouring the gods are really worthwhile in a plague because people who reject moral codes or who deny divine authority are just as likely to die as anybody else. When Thomas Creech translated Lucretius's On the Nature of Things into heroic couplets in 1683, Thucydides' point about religion appears as, now no religion, now no gods were feared. Greater than all, the present plague appeared. So that's it's a theme which comes even in Lucretius. He picks up the whole religious thing. Uh, but in Camus, it's, it's even bigger. In Camus, the plague is also an allegory, very strongly, for the German occupation of France during the Second World War. In a sense, that is the plague. So lots of different levels that the plague has been used at uh, in terms of the history of reception. Today I'm going to focus on the reception of the plague of Athens in the mid-17th century, although at the conclusion I will be glancing at much more recent times. Now I have to say, looking back at my work to date, I am very surprised at myself that I'm standing here now. I have studiously avoided the topic of the plague of Athens throughout my career, Occasionally I have reeled back in horror when yet another diagnosis comes out, um, but I haven't been anywhere near it myself till now. Retrospective diagnosis of the plague is a very old hobby and it's got no sign of losing steam. In the 18th century it was already a thriving activity. Suspects then included typhus, syphilis, smallpox encountering a virgin population and yellow fever. More recent additions to the possible list include ergotism, Rift Valley fever, measles, anthrax, toxic shock syndrome, Ebola, and most recently, of course, SARS. Now, the only thing it isn't is AIDS, but <laughs> maybe for someone it is. This sort of retrospective diagnosis isn't the sort of medical history I do, but here I am. All I can say in my defense is I'm not offering another diagnosis to add to the list, and I'm not going to talk about the hoary question of the relationship between Thucydides and Hippocratic medicine, which was his contemporary. If I was pushed, I would go with the suggestion that neither Thucydides nor Hippocratic medicine actually influenced each other. It was that both grew up within the same cultural context, a shared cultural context. Now, in addition to offering diagnoses, modern commentators often want to trace back the origin of germ theory to ancient Greece by suggesting that somehow contagion was understood, um, acquired immunity was understood by Thucydides. Again, no. There's certainly observation of what we would later see as acquired immunity and so on. But 
What Thucydides actually says is that no one caught the plague twice, or if they did, the second bout was very mild. Uh, that's impressive. He doesn't actually say this is because there's something called acquired immunity, but he does notice that there is this connection. He also says that they'd observe the basis of how infection is transmitted. He says those who visited the sick were more likely to become ill. Doctors noticed they were more likely to become ill, which is why most of them left town. But the precise mechanism is not speculated about. And indeed, if you look at thing, the idea of contagion or infection historically, there's a lot of variation in it. Physical proximity was recognized by Thucydides as increasing one's chances of getting it. But it's interesting that Thucydides just implies everybody noticed this. It's not him suddenly realizing, it's certainly not Hippocratic doctors realizing, it's just everyone noticed, but they didn't go any further in terms of developing theories to account for it. Now, instead of retrospective diagnosis or dodgy claims that Greeks suddenly discovered germ theory, I'm interested in the reception of the plague. And in that, I'm picking up a point about this, the meaning of contagion and the meaning of infection. Vivian Nutton, in a collection of essays on contagion published in 2000, wrote an essay called, Did the Greeks Have a Word for It? And he pointed out that Greek and Roman medical texts translated into English after the rise of germ theory in the 19th century, used words like contagion, contact, or infect, where the original Greek or Latin really didn't say that. So there was a reading of germ theory into these texts after the late 19th century. What I want to do today is take further this point about how the plague narrative in Thucydides is not only reread, but also retranslated according to the concerns of different historical periods. Obviously, translations have to be read in context. And the words contagion and infection are very widely used in English translations of Thucydides from the 1550s onwards, before, during, and after germ theory, and across changing ideas of how disease is spread. So the same word has very different meaning. For example, in 1550, Thomas Nichols published a translation of Thucydides based on an earlier French one that in turn was based on a Latin translation. So the sheer complexity of transmission is pretty bad here. The Latin translation was based on a Greek manuscript of Thucydides that has now been lost. So whether it's a good translation or a bad translation is really hard to know. But Nichols's translation was dedicated to the tutor of Edward VI, following in a, a European tradition of dedicating translations of Thucydides to princes for their political instruction. At one point, Nichols translates, another great evil was the malady was so contagious that those went for, who went for to visit to the sick were taken and infected like as the sheep be, one after another. Now, what does that look like in our manuscripts of Thucydides? Well, Rhodes's translation, which is the best one out there, has this infected like as the sheep be one after another, as just so they died like sheep. And I would just like to examine these sheep briefly. Well, not those sheep, but the sheep. One suggestion that's been made is that Thucydides is telling us the sheep were dying from the condition. And there's certainly evidence that the Athenians were keeping some livestock within the city walls during the period where they're besieged by the Spartans. Now, this has obvious implications if you want to play retrospective diagnosis, because it means you've got to find a condition that also manifests in animals. So it means you'd have to translate it, they died like the sheep. Unfortunately, Greek is not that sort of language. And when in Greek you just say like sheep, you could mean like the sheep, or you could just mean like sheep. The absence of the, def of the definite article in the Greek original doesn't mean you can't put it in. Anyway. Even with died like sheep, one can argue for popular awareness of the spread of some diseases. It might imply that herdsmen in antiquity were well aware of the effect one diseased animal could have on the rest of the flock. And Nichols's one after another does imply that it's based on watching disease spread through a flock. 
So perhaps the manuscript of Thucydides he was using, which may or may not be better or worse than the ones we've got, was suggesting that this actually went, the, the plague went through the population, taking one person after another, just as we all know by watching flocks of sheep. However, if you look at ancient veterinary writers, which seems like a good thing to do here, some mention contagion, some don't. Those who do mention contagion, the idea of actually spreading from one to another, say that it spreads because of foul breath. So it's not exactly our notion. Most Greek scholars, classicists today, would see the phrase, died like sheep, simply as a simile for submission, meaning it's the qualities of the sheep. The sheep, you just give in and die. So not suggesting that it actually does spread through sheep. Now that little example shows how complicated the text of Thucydides actually is. You've got to somehow read it in a way that takes account of how ancient Greek works, that looks at the different manuscript traditions, and that looks at what a Greek in 431 BC is most likely to have thought of if you said, died like sheep. Does it mean submission? Does it mean spread through a flock? Moving outside now to my main theme, the 17th <coughs> century, I want to look at how the plague of Athens was read by two non-medical writers. Firstly, Thomas Spratt in 1659, and then very briefly in my conclusion, Benjamin Jowett, whose translation of Thucydides was published in 1881 and was the one used by Logan Clendenning in his source book of medical history in 1942. So, Spratt. Thomas Spratt, later to become the Bishop of Rochester, best known now as the author of the first history of the Royal Society, wrote in 1659, The Plague of Athens, which happened in the second year of the Peloponnesian War, first described in Greek by Thucydides, then in Latin by Lucretius, now attempted in English by Thomas Spratt. By modern standards, Spratt is a pretty poor poet, but he was much praised in his own time, and I have to say, I'm liking him more and more. And this ode of over 700 lines went into seven editions and was reprinted widely in anthologies of verse. It also featured in a 1743 collection, The Plague, which just had lots of poems on the plague, the translation of Lucretius, and various other bits and pieces. This is not the only time in history when people write poems based on the plague of Athens. For example, there's another one surviving from 1866, a mere 54 lines long, not exciting like this one, and the 1866 one, Anonymous, opens with a reference to Homer's Iliad, uh, adding a layer of religious causation that certainly isn't in Thucydides by seeing the plague of Athens as being caused by the arrows of Apollo. If you think Spratt's poetry is bad, I think this is worse. Soon loudly through the vaulted sky there rang the dire portending silver bowstrings twang. <laughs> Do like the multiple adjectives. Now this 1866 poem is reading Thucydides in terms of Homer's Iliad, where it's the arrows of Apollo that cause the plague that hits the Greek army at Troy. In Alexander Pope's translation of 1865, so the year before this, Latona's son a dire contagion spread and heaped the camp with mountains of the dead. When I found this 1866 poem, I was initially quite excited thinking maybe it would have some sort of shift of understanding in the plague due to changing ideas about disease transmission. But actually it doesn't. Um, all it adds, apart from the religious reference, is a bit of whimsy about a maiden more pious than the rest who goes against the general grain of self-interest and panic and instead cradles her sick lover's head in her lap. Very romantic. But 1866 is slap bang in the middle of the period where germ theory emerged. Pasteur's key publications are in 1863 and 1867, so it's probably wrong to expect much to be shifting in poetry at this point. But back to the delightful Spratt. A bit of context here. Spratt comes out the year after Oliver Cromwell's death, shortly before the restoration of the monarchy, and it becomes very big because in 1665, the Great Plague of London hits. So it sort of grows out of an English Civil War context, but it then rapidly gets used in a Great Plagues of London context. 
It's today generally seen as a political poem. It's a commentary on the English Civil War with which Spratt grew up. And the plague affecting England is either England's sin of disobedience or the violence suffered in the Civil War or Oliver Cromwell himself. Cromwell died of septicemia from a urinary infection, probably complicated by malaria, a few months before the poem was published. And then, of course, a few years after, Charles II was invited back. Monarchy replaced the Commonwealth. So 1659, I think, is a pretty significant date. It starts, the Plague of Athens in Thucydides starts at the head of the body. So is this a suggestion that what's wrong with England starts at the head? The king, or indeed Cromwell as the Lord Protector. Is that the problem, that the disease starts at the head and then the entire state or body is affected? This is, of course, similar to Camus using the plague as an allegory for German occupation. And it does make sense to think about civil war in terms of stasis, um, the role of stasis in the body politic and in the body. Stasis is the Greek word for internal factional strife, so civil war. And in ancient poets and ancient political writers, stasis is very much associated with disease. Uh, the imagery of the body politic being sick uh, is very much a Greek thing. It's not new at all for Spratt. And certainly, even in Thucydides, the central point of his analysis of the failure of Athens to win the war against Sparta is that Athens was internally divided by faction. If Athens was not divided within herself, she could have fought off Sparta. And Thomas Hobbes went on to argue in Behemoth in 1680 that the teaching of classical political theory using Thucydides was actually the cause of the English Civil War. So it was all Thucydides' fault. The fact people read it caused the Civil War. So there are, the connections here are actually quite intricate. I think all this contemporary context is actually only part of the interest of this text, but it's certainly worth mentioning. Now, in his introductory epistle of the Plague of Athens poem, Spratt addresses his epistle to Walter Pope, the former proctor of Spratt's University, Oxford. And Spratt claims that Thucydides' prose account of the poem, of the plague, is actually more a poem than Lucretius' account, which is a poem. That's a bit tricky, so let's just go through it one more time. Thucydides is a prose account. Lucretius, writing about the plague based on Thucydides in the Roman period, is a poem. But as far as Spratt's concerned, Thucydides is more a poem. What does he mean by that? Because he says Thucydides had the advantages of being present on the place and assaulted by the disease himself, Thucydides says he suffered from it, therefore the shapes of the misery were still remaining in his mind, which must needs make a great impression on his pen and fancy. This is a most interesting reference. It's a sort of version of what we call maternal impression, where the pregnant woman gazes upon a picture or an animal or an object and, as a result, impresses the shape of that onto her unborn child, the power of the imagination. Uh, so we have at least one pregnant person here, so just be warned, be very warned. So Spratt seems to be arguing that the ability to write a good account of the plague is linked to the theory of imagination. Thucydides has an image of the misery caused by the plague in his mind, because he had it himself indeed, and he then recreates that, that misery on paper. And then in a sort of literary version of infection, the image is spread further to his readers. This is not unique to Spratt by any means. Thomas Creech, who quotes Spratt's poem with approval when he translates Lucretius in the 1680s, put a whole digression on whether fear promotes and propagates a plague into his translation of Lucretius. He examined the power of imagination and argued from Galen that it was fear, not just imagination, that spread plague. So if plague is infectious, in this context means plague is spread by fear. Uh, Creech wrote, if an infectious pestilential air meet with a body thus ill-disposed already, that body will soon imbibe the contagion and fall sick of the disease. 
Now, what does this imply for Spratt's own poem on the plague? Spratt realises he can't be as good as Thucydides. He can't do this because he hasn't seen it himself. He hasn't got the shapes in his own imagination. But he invokes another ancient writer, the great Roman orator Cicero, in support of the idea that one should aim at the noblest pattern, even if one has no hope of reaching it. And of course, if the plague, in a sense, is the civil war, then Spratt has seen it for himself. He's lived through it. He was born in 1635. So in that sense, Spratt is sick of it myself and seen others sick of the same. So as Thucydides' stated motive for describing the plague is to discover the same if it should come again, so to give an account so if it ever turns up again, we know what we're facing, Spratt may have written his poem in order to prevent the civil war happening again. You write it in order to make sure it won't happen. Now, the title of Spratt's book may suggest that he starts with the Greek of Thucydides, but actually he starts with Hobbes's translation into English, 1629, of the section on the plague of Athens from Thucydides. In his own poem, which then follows Hobbes's translation of Thucydides, Spratt's <coughs> main image of disease is that of the siege. Huge troops of maladies without a grim, a meagre, and a dreadful rout some formal sieges make and do with sure slowness to our bodies take. Some with quick violence storm the town and all in a moment down. Some one peculiar sort assail, some by general attempt prevail. And the picture here is of Oxford at the time of the Civil War because that was indeed besieged in the Civil War. And Spratt arrived to study in Oxford less than a decade after the siege of Oxford. Thucydides doesn't use the image of siege when he talks about how the plague struck. But of course the siege is pres present in his account because Athens is affected by the plague while the Spartans are besieging the city. So it's a real siege. The only difference is that the situation of Athens in 431 is not precisely a siege because the city's walls extended to the port at Piraeus. So access to supplies by sea was not cut off. It wasn't a complete siege. The last two lines of this section, some one peculiar sort of sail, some by general attempt prevail, I think refer to a different ancient source, to the early Roman Empire writer Plutarch, who talks about what new diseases are like and why new diseases arrive. He Plutarch includes a category of diseases that only affect one peculiar sort, so one class, one geographical region, or even just one individual. Plutarch has a lovely category of diseases that only affected one person. Spratt also talks about us breeding within ourselves the fatal seed of change, but that has been taken as a reference to Fracastoro's famous theory of the seeds of disease in 1546, I don't actually think Spratt's doing that. He's talking about the autumn of life, the seeds of mortality, rather than the seeds of disease. Now, there are lots of places where one can argue that the English Civil War lies behind this poem. The images of carnage that Spratt gives, uh, I think, could be seen in that sense. He talks about the aftermath of the plague, and he says, "'Scattered in fields the bodies lay.'" Well, in the plague of Athens, the bodies didn't lie in the fields. That was the whole point. They lay in the city because the city was behind walls and besieged and there wasn't anyone in the fields. So you could argue that's a reference to civil war, but it could just be something out of Lucretius. I have to say, it's not always easy to see where Spratt's getting his stuff from. But there's another wonderful occasion where Spratt offers a somewhat hyperbolic account of how a body which is already <clears throat> frail is then attacked from without, from outside, by a dangerous and destructful war. This is a very, very intricate passage. He talks about disease coming from outside and from inside. War comes from outside and inside, so does disease. If disease comes from inside, it's a form of civil war. He refers directly to the civil wars of the late Roman Republic in which Caesar fought Pompey for control of the state. And he talks about the intestine jar of elephants, which means the internal discord of elephants, sort of like elephants are fighting inside you. And also civil war is happening inside you. We all individually bear a Caesar and a Pompey. We've got two opposing armies 
inside us. There are lots of references to elephants um, being used in the ancient world, but this is just totally sprat. There are elephant fights which are used as a sort of terrifying spectacle. There's the external threat of Hannibal's attack on Rome, where Hannibal uses elephants and defeats the Romans. Um, but here in Sprat, the elephants are the plague, and knowledge of how to defeat them is the only way to cope. There's also a reference in Lucan's Pharsalia, Lucan's Civil War of 61 to 65 AD, where in Book 6 of Lucan, the elephant is an image of impenetrability, the darts rebounding from his horny hide, while his life within lies safe, protected, nor does spear avail to reach the fount of blood. So there are lots of ways of using elephants, but here they're a sort of internal thing. And the Punic War and Civil War references, so Punic War elephants, Caesar and Pompey, Civil War, is then followed by references to the Goths and the Barbarians, the Gothish and barbarous rage of plague and pestilence. That's the fall of Rome in the 4th and 5th centuries AD. So the Civil War is an image for internal discord, the fall of the Roman Empire, actually, I think, for the further decay of the body that happens in old age. These attend man's age, just as they're at the end of the Roman Empire, they're at the end of your life. That's when you get attacked from without. So in, internal causes of disease in your youth, and then external causes of disease later on. Sprat mixes and matches his Greeks and Romans all the way through. He mixes Roman Republican imagery with Roman Empire. He makes a reference even to the imperial purple, um, which here is the common people showing purple, i.e. imperial colour, because that's the colour they are. Well, they don't go purple in Hobbes' translation. They're reddish, livid, and beflowered with pimples and whelks. So the purple is very much him bringing in imperial imagery. And I think that is a shift. The shift to purple is a deliberate strategy evoking Cromwell's virtual dictatorship as protector. And he also throws in a bit of archaic Greek history when he calls the plague, and here I think he definitely means Oliver Cromwell, this new Draco, Draco being the legendary Athenian lawmaker whose laws were particularly harsh. So he really does mix and match Greek and Roman, Republic and Empire, Roman Civil War, English Civil War, and disease for him arises from internal discord and from outside attacks. For the origin of the plague of Athens, he follows Thucydides it comes from Ethiopia and the southern sands, but he departs from Thucydides in his use of the imagery of fire. It's a fatal and unhappy flame. There are cruel infectious heats in the air, and heat is destroying the earth, the air, the fields, and the cities. The origin of the plague, in that sense, is fire. Other references to pestilential fire, hidden seeds of fire, and flames. And he also mentions air. It's not just fire, it's also air. Air passes plague on. Now that's a reference to the Hippocratic corpus, possibly, where when the Hippocratic writers address the issue of epidemic disease, which they find very tricky, because in a humoral system it's your individual balance that's the problem, so if everyone gets the same thing at once, what do you do? The Hippocratic answer is to say it must be in the air. It's the only thing that we all share. So he's mixing his fire with his air. Um, more air references. The air no more was vital now, but did a mortal poison grow. Breath, the chiefest life, sign of life, turned the cause of death. So really playing on the reversal of normality there. Now, he also has an absolutely charming combination of classical and modern references, which I find very intriguing in this period. At one point, he shoves in a description of Athens's protector, the goddess Athena, or Minerva, trying to persuade Zeus, or Jupiter, to take away the evil that has struck her city. That's definitely not in Thucydides. And when he describes the reluctance of birds to eat the flesh of the dead, which is in Thucydides, he moves away to display his knowledge that Athena's bird is the owl. So the owls at Athens are but seldom seen and rare. The owls depart in open day rather than in infected ivy more to stay. <laughs>
So he's desperately trying to show off knowledge here. That's really got nothing to do with Thucydides or the plague. As for his explanation of why so many people get the disease at once, he goes for a classical explanation, referring to the Greek myth of the fates, who spin and cut the threads of individual lives. The sisters, now quite wearied in cutting single thread, began at once to part whole looms. It's a lovely way of dealing with this move from individual illness to collective Sometimes, okay, you may think already he's gone a bit too far, but sometimes he goes even further uh, with his Minotaur reference, where in the belly, when the disease gets there, the subtle labyrinths there of winding bowels did new monsters bear. Uh, reference to generation of disease in the guts being like the Minotaur in the labyrinth in ancient Crete. Pushing it, but why not? However, he doesn't just stop with the classics. He also has a reference to Harvey. That which before was nature's noblest art, the circulation from the heart, etc., etc., takes the infectious blood to every distant part. So the blood is infectious. And the spread of the blood through the body by circulation is one of the reasons why it affects every part of the body. So we've had the fire, we've had the air, we've had the blood. Normally, however, it is the air that's the, the key fact for him. When he talks about people robbing corpses, for example, he says, some rob the dead, though sure to be infected ere they fled, though in the very air, sure to be punished. So he doesn't have what, anything like a modern sense of infection. Of course, why should he? What infection means here is simply the power of a small substance to affect a much larger area. That's the original meaning of the Latin infectio, which is used for dying or staining. A small amount affects a large body of material. In the poem as a whole, he sees fire as the main way in which the plague spreads, though it also travels through air. There is no way that this is a modern theory of infection, but the combination of internal and external factors shows just how complex his ideas about how disease spreads are. So for Spratt, the plague gives him an opportunity to show off his classical knowledge and his modern knowledge, to combine images in a lively way, incorporating internal and external causes of disease in both the body and the body politic. In my conclusion, I just want to look at one other thing, a reading of Thucydides in the age of germ theory. The 1881, sorry, 1881 translation of Benjamin Jowett, seen on the left, classical scholar, commentator on Plato, theologian, Anglican priest, who rose to become master of Balliol, who was also a very close friend of Florence Nightingale and may have proposed marriage to her. She refused. The room in which he's alleged to have done this can be seen in Oxford. Florence, of course, was not a supporter of germ theory. Instead, as a sanitarian, she strongly believed in the power of stagnant air to breed disease. The correspondence between these two characters does exist, and I've had a bit of time in the archives looking at it. It includes discussions of sanitation, public health, and Thucydides. In 1871, Jowett wrote to her he was doing nothing but a little gentle correction of Thucydides. And a few months later in 1871, he wrote to her, I think you once said, damn Thucydides. There, I don't agree with you. I believe it's quite worthwhile to put the best and noblest history ever written into a permanent English form, discussing the questions which arise out of it or about it, and have, which have not been properly discussed. He presented Florence Nightingale with a copy of his translation, and in the accompanying letter singled out three passages he wanted her to read, one of which, of course, was The Plague of Athens. The plague of Athens can clearly be used by germ theorists and by sanitarians like Florence. In Jowett's translation, infection is used in a very post-germ theory sort of sense. I'll give you an example. Uh, appalling was the rapidity with which men caught the infection. So it's the, the idea of catching it, dying like sheep again. In her notes on nursing, Nightingale made it clear she was opposed to quote, what in ordinary language is called infection, because it leads to the attendants taking more care of themselves 
than of the patient. She gives the example of historical practices of plague nursing. She writes, the plague patient used to be condemned to the horrors of filth, overcrowding and want of ventilation. While the medical attendant was ordered to examine the patient's tongue through an opera glass and toss him a lancet to open his own abscesses with. Famously for her, diseases were not what she called separate entities which must exist like cats and dogs. She wrote, dogs do not pass into cats, but diseases do arise from each other. She stated that she'd seen smallpox arise in close rooms or overcrowded wards where it could not by any possibility have been caught, but where it must have begun. And she went on to say that with a little overcrowding, fever grows up, then it becomes typhoid fever, then it becomes typhus. This is not separate diseases, this is one disease changing. Spratt actually says something quite similar. Death in the most frequented places lives. Most tribute from the crowd receives. And in Thucydides, of course, overcrowding is a feature. He talks about the disease being aggravated by the people from the country moving into the city. There was nowhere for them to live. They had to live in stifling huts in the hot season of the year. And he's not saying, and that's why they caught the plague, but the idea of overcrowding being associated with plague is there. However, it's so gloriously there, it could be either taken to mean sanitarian beliefs, so Nightingale could use this, because it's hot, these diseases transform into each other, but also Jowett could use this and say that's why the contagion happened. So I'd argue that Nightingale's exasperated damn Thucydides isn't because she thinks Jowett should be spending time on a different ancient author, but because Thucydides' account of the plague becomes a pawn in the game played between sanitarians and germ theorists. For Jowett, people caught the plague of Athens. For Nightingale, diseases aren't caught. For Spratt, the plague is due to internal changes and external changes happening all at once. So I would conclude that the longevity of the plague of Athens as a medical curiosity isn't just because its symptoms allow so many retrospective diagnoses. diagnoses. It's because its model of disease causation is so open that it can be slanted towards miasma, air, fire, civil war within the body, attack from a foreign enemy, and it's got equal appeal to germ theorists and to sanitarians. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe ac.uk backslash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.